In this two-part video, we're going to interview the engineers behind the new Porsche 992.2911 to discuss the technical changes and why they made them. In the second part, we'll drive the car and discuss how the updates feel to determine if the next generation design improves on an already sorted platform. I'm here in Germany for the launch of the brand new Porsche 911, 992.2. We're here for the base Carrera and the GTS. We'll be talking about the Carrera S and all the other 911s in the future. Um, I have a very special gentleman with me. This man is named Michael. Michael, please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Michael Rösler and I'm the responsible director for the motor car line 911. Which means you're the head of the 911, which is a very cool job to have, sir. Let's start high level before we get into some of the nitty gritty with Christian later on the drivetrain. What were the goals for the 992.2? Yeah, main goal is um, to make a new 911, but don't make a new 911. So it has to remain a sports car. Yeah. Um, and most of the things are all about performance. And of course, we have to look a little bit um, after the regulations we have all over the world. Things are changing, so we had to change a little bit, but um, we also wanted to keep the performance of the 911 up to date and bring it to a whole other level. Without getting too heavy, too fat, too squishy, all the things that all the... Exactly. <laughs> there's a... We're, we're in changing times. People either love EVs, hate EVs, and hybridization used to be a dirty word. It's a word that not a lot of people liked. <clears throat> with this vehicle, specifically starting with the GTS, it is now a true hybrid drivetrain. You have a battery, you have an electric motor, two electric motors, one in the turbocharger and one in the gearbox. How has the hybridization changed the 911, or has it not? Yeah, maybe some, some words to the primal goals we had with the car. Yeah. Of course, we wanted to increase um, the power of the car and the performance. That was the biggest goal for the whole development. Um, and we try to avoid um, those bad things about hybridization, which are mainly um, generating more weight in the car. So actually, we have about 50 kilograms more um, than any old one. But substantially more horsepower, correct? Substantially more horsepower, it's about 60 horsepower more. Why, why couldn't you achieve that with the three liter? Is it primarily due to emissions in the future cycles? Yeah, it's mainly this, this uh, Lambda 1 um, we have to meet. So this cuts us a little bit of power in the upper regions um, if you rev the car. Um, and we can keep that with the hybridization. So, so you can still get all the power up top. We can still get all the power because we have the electrical motor in the PDK, in the drivetrain, and uh, we have this um, electrical turbocharger. I was told by one of your very kind engineers off camera, and I did get to ride along in the new GTS, that this is now off the line, not using launch control due to the e-motor, both in the turbocharger <clears throat> and in the gearbox, quicker than like an old turbo, correct? Yes, correct. You now have two drivetrains. You have the old drivetrain and the regular Carrera. It's the three liter, it's the 982 Evo engine. It's bi-turbo, there are some technical changes. New turbocharger off of the old GTS. It gets the intercooler off the turbo. It's mainly done for emissions, but you do get nine more horsepower. I think I'm right, nine more horsepower. You're so right. A little bit faster, but it's mainly done for emissions. And of course you have this thing, brand new engine, 3.6 liter single turbo <clears throat> hybrid drivetrain. It's found in the GTS and it now makes over 530 horsepower and it's good for zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds. And it does the Nürburgring in 716.9. Exactly. Uh, perfect, I got those numbers <laughs> right, which is about eight or nine seconds faster than the prior generation yeah, GTS. Right. It is substantial. From an interior and exterior perspective, mm -hmm. what was changed? Is it just front and rear bumpers and the gauge cluster? Yes, uh, gauge cluster and um, yes, the communication system has this, this new stuff um, we have also seen in the Panamera and the Cayenne, the connectivity features. Um, but the instrument cluster, I think, um, is kind of some kind of special because um, it gave us possibility to, to get some old things. You see it if you get in the car. That is like definitely one screen. of the controversies though with the car. Yes. I'm sure you've you guys have the internet like everybody else. Yeah. A lot of people are mad that, that the beautiful analog tack is gone, right? Like, oh, they did it because it's cheaper or something. Why did you do it? Is it just customization? Is it so you can actually see all the gauges now? It's mainly customization and possibilities to show us a cool track screen, a cool special screen we have in the, in the 911. It's called signature screen. And with more information through the hybridization, we have also battery status, um, recharging status, 
recuperation, all this stuff, and that wouldn't be possible to get in this analog cluster. The body panels, sorry, going back a step, mm -hmm. the fenders are the same, the hood's the same, yeah. and the roof, it's just the changes in the front and the rear bumper, correct? Exactly. I heard there are some slight aero changes as well. Can you walk me through that? Yes, of course. Um, we see it stand just right in front of the car. We see those bigger ones. We also have some light features like the indicators, the position lights, um, which went into the headlights with the special styling, which are much more filigree and I think looks more interesting like the old one. Your engineer, Clen, was telling me that the aero kit as well now generates genuine downforce at VMAX, yes. which is you know, a, a rarity in the, the, the baseline 11s. Most of these cars, and basically every car without big wings, traditionally generates lift when they get to VMAX. You don't have that in the aero equipped cars. Exactly. Um, before we head and speak to another engineer, is there anything else you want to talk about? Obviously, you've been responsible for this car for a very long time. Um, what do you want your future customers to know about the 992.2? Yeah, I'm very happy they can get this car with uh, much more increased power, much more increased performance, and only 50 kilogram more weight. Perfect. It'll be fun. And the prices have not gone up that much. It's something I didn't talk about. <laughs> the base Carrera is now a little bit over $120,000. Obviously, you get more performance, nine horsepower, and some more standard features. The GTS is now 167 or around there, US dollars and you now get rear steer standard, of course, far more power, a more sophisticated drivetrain, and more interior options as well. So with that, let's go speak to Christian. Now it's time to talk about drivetrain. What most people are excited about is your new hybrid single turbo engine. This is now called the 9A3. Sir, please introduce yourself. Hi, Jack. My name is Thomas Brandl. I'm responsible for the engine calibration of this complete new drivetrain. So Thomas, you're, I guess, in American words, you are the chief engineer of drivetrain, correct? One of the chief engineers, thank you. Yes. Let's talk about, before the hybridization, let's talk about how this is a brand new engine. It is not shared with the old three liter. Let's talk about the mechanical things you've changed starting with the internals, entirely new uh, block, correct? It's a complete new engine from scratch, 3.6 liters. We have close to none carryover parts to the predecessor. The engine builds very low, um, 110 millimeters lower than the predecessor to get more room for packaging of the hybrid components. Um, we have no auxiliary drive anymore, um, so there is some um, for example, the water pump is driven by the oil pump. Um, we have a very special oil circuit on a flat six engine, this integ integrated dry sump. And you and have very, very shallow pan. Very, very shallow pan, yeah. How is it a integrated, I know that was a conversation in the old motor, but what is an integrated drive sump? Because it's not a traditional sump like you mm -hmm. get on a GT car engine. Uh, it's correct? a mixture between a um, traditional sump um, and, a, and a dry sump, um, so we have an, very special oil pump in, in this engine and we have to to tell the oil where to go to, to go back to the so you don't run into starvation issues correct yeah, right. uh, cooling you have a standalone heat exchanger for the cooling you're not running off the radiator correct right we have an integrated cooler and an oil separator um, exactly. what kind of temps are you seeing when you're on the racetrack uh, we try to manage the oil temperature um, up to um, 110 degrees um, internal componentry uh, is it all forged components, crank, pistons? Some of them, most of them, exactly. And um, very special is also the monoturbo architecture. Yes. Um, we come from the B-turbo architecture. We decided to go to a monoturbo. Um, this is quite big. As we de-throttled the complete engine, is one step to towards Lambda 1. Um, so no fuel enrichment in the, in the complete engine map. And um, we have monoturbo um, to compensate some of the weight um, due to the hybridization. So one very, very large turbo. One very big one, and um, to, to overcompensate um, the, the turbo lag, what you would expect with a big turbocharger, we overcome this with the electrification of the turbocharger. So traditionally, a turbo runs off exhaust gases, and the car itself is spooling up the turbo with RPM. Exactly. Now you are independently spooling the turbo with an electric motor, correct? Exactly. Um, normally you're dependent from the exhaust stream and you control it with, um, for example, the wastegate. 
We don't have a wastegate control anymore, so we control it with the e-motor only and therefore we are more independent from, um, from the exhaust stream for the turbocharger um, um, RPM. So in, let's call it response time, when people think big turbo, they think lots of lag. This, based upon the charts you showed me and the charts we're going to show you guys, spools up even faster than the prior generation by turbo setup in the old GTS, yes, correct? Yes. By like seconds faster. Seconds faster, depending on the load point um, where you where you start, um, sometimes up to three, um, two to three seconds faster that you reach the, the maximum um, boost pressure and therefore also the maximum torque for the engine. So between the electric motor you have in your PDK, which we will talk about, and the electric motor in your turbocharger, you have almost immediate response does it feel like a naturally aspirated car when you're winding this thing out to 7,500 RPM or exactly. what sort of the power like, characteristic? Like a very big um, natural aspirated engine where you have a very fast response, it feels, like, it feels more like that. It feels like a 5 liter flat 6 versus Maybe, a 3.6 yeah. liter. Um, hybridization. Uh, I spoke earlier about how for many people it's a dirty word, right? Mm. At least in America, people have a issue with the complication and maybe it makes it more numb, but you're saying the way this engine feels, it feels like a traditional, what you and I are used to in the, the Porsche engines, correct? Right, um, we tried to, to bewear the character of a 911, that it's a pure um, driver um, experience and that it feels like a more or less con conventional drivetrain and um, to have um, a direct response um, with the electric e-motor but you still feel the emotions of an, of an internal combustion, combustion car. So walk me through how the hybridization works. You have a 1.9 kilowatt hour battery pack that sits in the front. That battery pack has its own cooling circuit. How does the electricity work? Mm -hmm. what, what's the path of power, so to yeah. speak? For example, one operating point, if you immediately go to the throttle, um, if you want um, to accelerate, um, we put the power from the battery first to the turbocharger to spool it up quickly. To spool up the turbocharger to provide compressed air to the engine. Uh, and in parallel, we put the energy, the residual energy, to the e-motor on the PDK to accelerate the car already. Where's the energy coming to charge the battery? Mm -hmm. um, so even at the high load points, at full throttle, um, the turbocharger recovers heat energy out of the exhaust stream to put back um, energy whether directly to the e-motor, to the PDK, if you still want to accelerate. And if not, um, it puts the energy back to the battery. So and under full load, WOT watt, right. at full RPM, you are actively recharging Re the system because you have so much energy. excess. Exactly. And that, from both of our understandings, is the first time that's ever been applied in a, a production automotive application, exactly. correct? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other issue, and this is something that many hybrid sports cars have run into, and this is what we haven't talked about yet, is something like take an E-Ray or an NSX Type S or an NSX. After a while on a racetrack, and really in the case of something like an E-Ray, it's not that long, you completely deplate the battery or you overheat the battery in the case of a traditional EV. Do you run into those issues with this hybridization setup? Uh, we don't run in a in a thermal um, derating, um, and it, it depends on the on the drive mode. So if you go in Sport Plus, um, the operating strategy is like um, for a hot lap on the Nürburgring. So you start with 100% um, state of charge, and in the end of the Nürburgring, um, you end up at close to zero. Um, so when Jörg is driving this and setting a lap time, you can start at 100% and by the time you're done, you're at zero, but you still have full power for seven minutes and 16 seconds and some milliseconds after if that, correct? If you're fast enough, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so for a regular person, you are unlikely to derate. You're on the street, you'll never derate yeah, the battery. It's pretty hard, it's yeah. pretty hard. Never say never, but difficult. Yeah. But you're not running into a thermal problem, correct? No. And normally when you're on track as well, the braking is regening the battery, correct? Right, um, we, we collect everything on energy, what we find, um, whether to um, by mechanical recuperation of the e-motor or the thermal recuperation of the, of the turbocharger. Something I want to make clear to the people, this is not like a plug-in hybrid. You cannot drive in pure EV. You never decouple the engine from the exactly. gearbox. Exactly, we don't have a clutch um, between the e-motor and the PDK and the, and, the, and, and the combustion engine, so the e-motor is always there whether it supports or it um, recovers. 
So let's talk about the PDK. It's a good time to bring that up. Okay. Brand new, uh, brand new application for this car. You have no clutch between the electric motor that sits in the same housing as your traditional dual clutch eight speed, correct? Right. How, how does that system work, I guess? Is, it's running one cooling loop like the uh, uh, Panamera. The e-motor is integrated in the gearbox, so it's um, oil cooled with the, with the gearbox oil. And um, we have also um, a, a heat exchanger, so it's, it's cooled um, by, the, by the gearbox. And that e-power primarily comes in at low RPM, sort of as a powerful, correct? Um, this is where we, where we could use it, it best, exactly. And it still puts its power down through the traditional PTV Plus one equipped differential, correct? Right. Um, the last thing I'm going to bring up, I know you're not the suspension guy, but all of this hybrid technology, the 400 volt architecture that exists, is powering the rear steer that comes standard on this and the PDCC, correct? Exactly, and the climate compressor and so on. So as we have the 400 voltage system in the car already now, yeah. we try to use it as much as possible um, because it's just efficient to use the high voltage um, for the auxiliary components. Well, as we're running into rain, as you exactly. can clearly hear, I'm clearly, the, weather. clearly the, the heavens have opened up and they want us to end this interview. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap this up? I'm sure I'll see you in Spain when this car is launched, but so. um, anything else you want to talk about from a public perspective? Um, what else do you want to hear? Maybe um, one special thing on the turbocharger is that we, that, that we don't have an, an uh, wastegate. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that, so it's pretty hard to to control um, the, the, the compressed air and and, uh, and uh, um, RPM of the turbocharger only with the e-motor. So this was very challenging for the application. And trying to get it to be as linear as possible as exactly. well, correct? Yes. Um, other than that, I will tell you, and I know I've said this to you plenty off camera, I am very, very excited to feel how this car drives. So thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. There you have it. A big thanks to Porsche for taking the time to discuss the technology behind the new 911. In part two, we will drive the car and talk about the other changes to suspension and much more. And of course, explain how the car drives in greater detail. Thanks for watching and for the continued support.